Hi, it's Chris. Welcome back to Rewrite and Sip. Um, today, I'm going to share with you my library haul. I have been getting a lot of books from Barnes & Noble and Amazon lately, but it occurred to me I haven't found or just haven't looked for any books at my local library. And my library has an extensive collection of used books that are donated and they're sold for 25 cents for a paperback, 50 cents for hardcover. And what's great about it is that the funds go into programs, the children's programs and different things. And it really helps the library, it supports the library. And I haven't been buying them as much. So I thought, why not do a library haul, see what's new, see what I haven't read and share it with you. So the first book that I found is Angel's Crest by Leslie Schwartz a book I've never heard of, an author I've never heard of. But it did sound like a, a very um, kind of interesting edge of your seat read. It's basically about a father and son, and the father has sole custody of his little boy, and the little boy is the light of his life. And they decide to go out into the woods just to take a look and admire the beauty of the forest. And little Ethan falls asleep in his car seat, and the father sees these two amazing bucks and decides that just for a moment he'll get out of the truck and take a closer look because Ethan is sleeping. Unfortunately, when he gets back to the truck, the door is open and Ethan is nowhere in sight. And so what happens is it becomes a search um, against a blizzard looking for this little three-year-old boy with the help of some other people. One of them is um, an ex-wife, an ex-best friend, an older judge, and a middle-aged couple, and everyone is dealing with past wounds. So um, the little boy's disappearance brings up these past wounds for everyone, but also miraculously provides a chance for love and redemption as they struggle to make sense of the inexplicable. And I will say that the thought of a, a missing child always kind of hits me hard. I think of my own kids, and I'm so grateful that they just survived childhood. We've never had to deal with that. I think of my grandchildren and I, I, I worry about that. It just seems like you hear stories about that more and more. But I just thought maybe, maybe I'd like to read this, you know, despite feeling a little angst. The story, the setting, the winter, the deer, the forest, I, I do love that kind of a story. And I thought, why not bring this home? And so this came home with me. Another book that I found that I thought might be interesting, Every Exquisite Thing by Matthew Quick, who is the author of the Silver Linings Playbook, uh, a book I did not read, and the movie version, I, I did not see the movie. But this book, um, star athlete, straight-A student Annette O'Hare plays the dutiful role of daughter for as long as she can remember. But one day a teacher, a beloved teacher, gives her his worn copy of The Bubblegum Reaper, a mysterious out-of-print cult classic, and the rebel within Annette awakens. As the new and outspoken Annette attempts to insert her true self into the world with wild abandon, she befriends a reclusive author and falls in love with a young, troubled poet. And I will say, any book where the main character is an author, any movie where the main character is an author, and I do have quite a few, I pick that up. I grab that. I love to read about other authors. I love fictional stories about authors and their struggles and their obstacles. And so I thought this sounded like it, it might be an interesting read. So that came home with me. This is called A False Sense of Wellbeing. The author is Jean Braselton. I have not heard of her, but it is a national bestseller. And if you're familiar with Anne Rivers Siddons, she quoted this book as, this may be the first, the best first novel I've ever read. And so this also was a winner of the Georgia Author of the Year Award for First Novel. And it's about Jesse Maddox, who's got a nice, comfortable married life in a little town called Glenville, Georgia, with the most responsible husband in the world. And somehow, when maybe when you have it too good, she decides that she's just looking for happily ever after. Uh, the storybook romance never came, the happily ever after. It's just the same old, same old. And somehow she's picturing herself as the perfect grieving widow. And now, as she drives into her midlife crisis, she's joined by a colorful cast of eccentrics. And I love books with little quirky characters. And that includes her best friend who's having an affair with a younger man. 
uh, her sweet natured grandmother who's charged with killing her husband. And that just, whoop, that's a spin. And her younger sister, Ellen, who was just born to be a guest on Jerry Springer. And so this uh, is about a trip home to her childhood small town, which ends up raising a lot more questions than answers. And Jessie is forced to face a startling truth and confront the tragedy that shattered her heart and shook her faith and love and the future. And I love stories. This is paperback and I do love stories, small town stories. I've written several small town stories and I love a small town story with a cast of quirky fun characters. So this came home with me. Here we have, many of you probably have read it or saw the movie that is currently running on Freeform for the 31 Days of Halloween, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. This actually would have been a great October read if I had found it then. It is about a mysterious island, an abandoned orphanage. And the story opens with a horrific family tragedy that sets 16 year old Jacob journeying to this remote island off the coast of Wales where he discovers the ruins of Miss Peregrine's home for peculiar children. And as he explores decaying bedrooms and hallways, it becomes clear that this was more than peculiar, that the children might have been dangerous. And they may have been quarantined on this deserted island for a good reason. And somehow, impossible though it seems, they may still be alive. This does sound chilling. It does sound like a great spooky season reading. I, I don't know if you've read it. I don't know if I'll be able to read it this month, but it does sound perfect. But it came home with me. A Greek Doctor in Jerusalem by Eddie Shahar. And what caught my eye first off, I, I like the cover. Um, but what tipped me off is that the back, very basic back, I'm familiar with this. Um, I would say either a small press, but more likely this was self-published. There's no author picture or bio. Uh, other than a very short sentence, Shahar is married, a mother of three, grandmother of five, and this is her debut international novel. What I liked is that it's set in Jerusalem, and I like books in other countries, and it's 1908. Under Ottoman rule, as scarcity and disease ravage the city, the distinguished doctor, Patrius F. Cleide, struggles to do his duty as head of the municipal hospital. Inside the clinic, he fights with determination for the lives of his patients, but outside its walls, the foreign doctor keeps mainly to himself, unaware even of the effect his handsome demeanor and graceful manner have on a certain member of his staff. Years later, a discarded notebook unearthed in an ancient storeroom reveals a long forgotten story brimming with intrigue. Its pages overflow with secrets, forbidden love affairs across religious divides and epidemics of disastrous proportions. And at the center of them all, you guessed it, Dr. Ephclides, a doctor in Jerusalem, and a young nurse whose heart he captured. And I, I don't read a ton of romance as much as I used to. I do like it. I like sweet romance. I love Hallmark. But I just like the setting and the whole premise and anything with, you know, things being unearthed and notebooks being found and old remnants of the past being discovered in the future. I like that kind of story. And this came home with me. And last but not least, and this made my trip to the library and my whole find. This is, if this was a treasure hunt, this was the hidden gem that I did not expect to find. Ernest Hemingway, A Movable Feast. And I have read this two or three times. I have a copy already. But uh, this one looked, it, first of all, my copy does not have Hemingway on the cover. That caught my eye. It also has a sticker that says it's a restored edition. But when I looked at the back, and this is basically, you know, a Hemingway's account of being in Paris around uh, after First World War, struggling as a writer, his marriage to his first wife. It is very, very interesting, especially if you're a writer, you'll find this interesting. But what grabbed my eye was the sticker on the bottom, which a lot of used bookstores have a very basic sticker with a price. This one, however, said a movable feast Hemingway and at the very bottom, Shakespeare and Company, 11 euros. And if you could see that, I knew right away this could not be from um, an independent bookstore in my area. Uh, obviously, this came from abroad. And it also had a bookmark. And the bookmark features a picture of Shakespeare and Company, the bookstore, which there are only two, to my knowledge, one in New York City that I have not gotten to yet and one in Paris, the one I really want to get to. If you look at the back, there is a list of 
upcoming events. And I knew right away because we in the States say May 7, on this bookmark it says 7 May, but at the very bottom it says Shakespeare and Company, customized books and gifts shipped from Paris with love, 37 Rue de la Boucher, 75005 Paris. And I don't know if I said that right. And I, I, it could have been ordered, but why would you order it from Paris if you can get it here? I think somebody from my area went to Paris, bought the book, read the book, maybe on the play home, maybe at home, and then decided when they were done with it, maybe they don't keep their books, they decided to donate it. I have a keeper shelf, and there are some books I will never donate, never share, never pass to anyone. And this, if it were my copy, and I had bought this at Shakespeare and Company, it would be on my keeper shelf. So this very happily went home with me. And now uh, I just want to talk about October Reads real quick. If you haven't seen my very first video, I am sharing my October Reads for spooky season. I'm diving into a genre I don't normally read, which is horror. And I don't know, I don't know if I will ever read horror again, but I am moving along. However, uh, a book came to my attention. Several booktubers have been talking about this book. I've passed it in the bookstore and I did find the cover uh, get, grabbing my attention. I didn't pick it up at the time, but after a few booktubers talked it up, I thought I'm going to add this to my October reads. Like I need another book. Uh, I really need another pair of eyes, but I've added the September house to my October reads written by Carissa Orlando. And the cover quote is, just when you thought you'd seen everything a haunted house novel could do, this book comes along. And the inside, when Margaret and her husband Hal bought the large Victorian house on Hawthorne Street for sale at a surprisingly reasonable price, they couldn't believe they finally had a home of their own. Then they discovered the hauntings. Every September, the walls drip blood. The ghosts of former inhabitants appear, and all of them are terrified of something lurking in the basement. Most people would flee, and I know I would. Margaret is not most people. After four years, Margaret has learned how to live with the house. It's her house after all. But Hal can't take it anymore and he leaves abruptly. Now he's not returning calls and their daughter Catherine, who knows nothing about the hauntings, arrives, intent on looking for her missing father. To make things worse, September has just begun and with every attempt Margaret and Catherine make to find Hal, the hauntings grow more harrowing because there are some secrets the house needs to keep. Look at that cover. This cover also probably grabbed my eye because it reminded me of a book I finished in September called The Only One Left by Riley Sager. And what I found, uh, the, that's more gothic style and more suspense. And this sounds like outright horror creepy. What they do, I think, have in common, I will find out when I start reading tonight, is that in both books, it seems like the house is a character in itself. So I'm very excited to finally just add it to my list, get started reading tonight, and I can't wait till next week when I come back and let you know how my October reads went and what I liked and what I didn't like. So, an additional read for October. And now, um, a little bit off from reading. I just want to mention something cute. Um, we all know social media has, it's good and it's bad, and oftentimes, uh, TikTok in particular, gets a bad rap, but my daughter found, um, an adorable trend on TikTok and decided to do it herself. And it's actually called You've Been Booed, where someone gifts someone else with a little gift basket for spooky season with little spooky items the person would like. And my daughter did that for me. And I'm gonna share that basket with you now. Okay, the basket itself is adorable. There's a little plastic bat on it and it's just adorable. And when she gave it to me, the flag was up and it said, You've been booed. It came with a Halloween card, some spooky Halloween socks, which not really too spooky, but it's a cat, and I love cats, and I love fluffy socks. She knows me well. My favorite Halloween candy, some, um, I know candy corn, a lot of people, you hate it, you love it. I like Indian corn, the chocolate tips. I love dark chocolate, dark chocolate pumpkin, marshmallow and a beautiful candle which first of all it's purple gray and black and there's a witch's hat and purple is my favorite color and again she knows me well and the scent it's called pumpkin cake pop and the scent is vanilla cinnamon 
nutmeg and I love cinnamon I love vanilla and just take off the hat it's a two-wick candle it absolutely smells delicious it's adorable and I doubt very much I'll be putting this away it'll probably stay on my desk year round with some of my other favorite candles but I thought it was such a thoughtful thing to do with such a fun trend and we need fun right now everyone needs a little fun and I just thought it was very sweet and thoughtful for her to fool me and now we'll go on to the tea of the week. This week, I have my tea in one of my favorite mugs, which is Brew in my favorite color purple. And this week's tea is brought to you by Twinings. It's orange and cinnamon spice. And I love cinnamon tea, but sometimes on its own, it's a little peppery, a little strong. But with cinnamon spice, it's just such a great smooth blend. I have not had it iced, but it's a great hot tea. And so if you're looking for uh, something warm to sip on and a new tea to try and you haven't tried it yet, I recommend Twinings Orange and Cinnamon Spice Tea. And um, other than that, I think it's time for me to go. <laughs> time for me to let you go. And I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining me. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you'd like to keep up and, and stay informed of my future videos, please subscribe. I'm going to list the books from my library hall in the box below in case you'd like to check any of those out. You might be able to find them at your own library where you can take them out. You might be able to get them on Amazon if you want to give them a try. Um, I will also list the Tea of the Week in case you didn't catch it. And other than that, I guess that's it for this week. So happy to be here and so happy you joined me. I hope to see you next week. And until then, have a great week. Bye now.